Revelation that gives a, a really good insight into how people generally heard scripture in the ancient world. Um, the verse is uh, Revelation chapter one, verse three. Blessed is the one, notice the singular there, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. Uh, what I want you to notice in this text is the reading practices of the day. It's expected that one person is reading and everybody else is listening. And so most folks who first encountered what we call New Testament scripture encountered it as um, a heard, something they heard. It was an oral presentation. And so consequently, the documents themselves are written in a way that pleases the ear more than the eye, if that makes sense. And so there's careful attention to how you phrase something, how you flip a phrase over, and uh, uh, the closer you get to the text, the more you see these things. I want to just raise the, the thought of writing and, writing and reading in the ancient world, but um, you know several of Paul's letters have multiple authors. We generally ignore the other authors. And what I'd like to do is just raise to your attention because we've got one of those letters in Philippians in which we've got multiple authors, even though it's probably Paul's primary voice, no doubt. But when we think of writing a letter today, we go to either a keyboard or to our own private setting. But in the ancient world where people live packed, packed on top of each other, it was actually hard to have an environment where you wrote a letter in privacy as we think of privacy today. And so I'm wondering what changes in our mind about how we read the New Testament letters if we at least entertain the notion that it's not just Paul's voice that's coming through, that Paul, in fact, has um, taken his co-author and they have actually talked it out and communicated back and forth with each other. Now, what this does for us is, is that Paul's letters start off not as a monologue, but they start off themselves as a bit of a dialogue with the first dialogue being among the folks who are present during the writing of the letter. So I ask interesting questions, where did Paul write? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that we often are able to go into a private space and write privately without noise around us. Probably not Paul's world. If Paul is in the marketplace, say in Corinth, then he's in a very busy place as he writes his letters. So. The other thing that I want to draw out is that Paul didn't often, in the sense of actually put pen to paper, write his letters. That in fact, he does uh, employ um, an amanuensis is kind of the technical terms, but scribe or secretaries. And these, these secretaries, some of them are actually mentioned in the text. For example, Tertius is mentioned as the writer, you know, the scribe of Romans, Sylvanus, or, or Silas is uh, involved in the writing of 1 Peter. And then uh, we know that Paul is using a scribe because of the way he closes off a couple of letters where he picks up the pen and he writes for himself. In fact, in Galatians, he says, I, Paul. You know, he picks up the letter. See what large letters I'm writing with, Paul will say, because he's using a scribe. There's been some fascinating studies on ancient letter writing. And so, the next chart I th is always amazing to me. How much did it actually cost to produce the writings of the New Testament? And based on the number of lines that are in the manuscripts, in fact, that's how uh, scribes were paid is they would count the lines of text. So you would count the lines of text. Um, Richards, in his book, uh, Paul in First Century Letter Writing, has tried to calculate what would that mean in modern terms. And you might be surprised at how expensive it was to write, particularly a heavy document in the ancient world, using a professional scribe. And so Philippians would have cost the equivalent, these are American dollars too, Philippians would have cost the equivalent of $515 to actually produce. Writing was, in fact, quite expensive in the ancient world, at least some level of professional writing. And let me add a, a, another interesting feature uh, that I think will um, 
will help you understand um, how Paul's letters, particularly, we're going to stay with Paul's, how they were actually um, disseminated and distributed across the empire. There were always, and this is important, there were always two letters that were written, two copies. Um, in, in the conversation around inspiration, there is the desire to get back to an original prototype copy that is generally called the autograph. The truth is, is that in ancient letter writing, there was always two autographs. And this will make perfect sense when you hear this. The um, one letter was sent and one was kept as a copy by Paul. It kind of makes sense once you realize that. Of course, they would have done that, particularly if they thought it was important. And uh, so, so Paul probably kept a copy and the Philippians got a copy. Well, anyway, if you want to know more about this, um, let me jump down here. Here's the book. So if you want to know more. When we send a letter here, we use usually some official postal means, whether it's Canada Post or the U.S. Post. In the ancient world, the only people who got to use the official postal system was the government. There was no system for, um, for sending letters in the ancient world. And so you sent it through somebody you trusted or um, someone headed the direction that um, you're, the people you were sending the letter to. And so, um, so in the sending of a letter, there would be a copy that's made, as I've said. That copy would be then carried by the, uh, uh, would be carried by the letter carrier the carrier, though, it, particularly in Paul's case, where he used he used uh, trusted allies, would not only deliver the letter, but would also be the first reader of that letter. Remember what I told you about how uh, letters were heard in the ancient world, and we actually uh, uh, we actually know who carried Philippians because Paul tells us in that letter, Epaphroditus is the one carrying the letter. And so um, we also know who carried Romans first, and it was Phoebe. We know this because her recommendation letter, uh, which is attached to Romans in, in, in our copies, but her recommendation letter is at the end of the book, chapter 16. And so, um, so the process of getting a letter from here to there was a little more complex in the ancient world because you had to have somebody that you trusted to some degree to carry the letter. And if you trusted the people a great deal, that, that person would be the first reader of that letter. Somewhere, now, and, and I really try to help us understand this, Philippians, uh, if I could, by the way, I, I sent you guys a copy of a working copy of the text that you can you can manipulate in Word um, to use for your, you know, to look at the text much more closely. But I think it's also good to have a copy of Philippians in front of you as a single copy because that's how the Philippians received it. And so when we do our nice cross-referencing to 1 Corinthians and Thessalonians, which I, again, in our Bible study, we ought to do that. You have to remember that when you're reading Philippians, they're not reading 1 Corinthians and Thessalonians and all the cross-references, cross-referencing text. That, in fact, they're, they're reading Philippians. It's a letter from, um, from a minister who helped call their community of Christians into being. So, you know, the letters from Paul. Um, we, we also think of Paul today as being kind of a hero. Not everybody bought into that in, in the first century. And so they're not collecting Paul's letters immediately. And so after, my guess is after Paul's in prison or after Paul's, Paul passes or uh, is martyred, uh, somebody decides that there's a need to bring Paul's letters together. And so somewhere around Ephesus and Corinth and Rome, people are putting together Paul's letters. And so somewhere along the way, uh, somebody had to gather these up in a collection. Now, they didn't automatically end up in a collection of 27 documents like our New Testament. It's over a period of time, but 
those that are interested in collecting Paul's letters will collect those. And somebody had to be in the process saying, because Paul even admits in some of his letters that um, there are letters being written in his name that he did not write. And so somewhere along the way, as people are pulling Paul's letters together, somebody is probably saying, okay, that's not from Paul and sorting through that stuff. By the way, it's interesting. And somebody puts it in a, a certain arrangement. You guys, I think uh, I've shared this with some of you before. The New Testament does have an interesting arrangement when it comes to Paul's letters. And here's the principle, the longer letters before the shorter letters and letters to churches before letters to people. That's, that's the arrangement. So in your collection, if Hebrews is at the tail end, that arranger thought that Hebrews was not by Paul, but in some of the manuscripts, Hebrews, because it's much longer, actually ends up on the front end after Romans and 1 Corinthians, I believe. But it ends up on the front end instead of the back end. And so here, here's what I want you to imagine. Paul maybe working, well, of course, we know where he's working here. He's in prison. He's got, he does have access to some people because if it's a Roman imprisonment, he's under house arrest and he, he's having people come and go. But I want you to imagine Paul using a secretary to write a letter, duplicate, one for Paul, one to the Philippians. And then later after Paul dies, there is a push to begin to collect Paul's letters together. So I want you to have a real sense of how that letter started out as a letter to a particular church and eventually became available eventually in time to be in our Bibles. Again, if you're interested in ancient letter writing, here's your go-to guy. E. Randolph Richard, Paul, first century. Uh, first century letter writing. It's a great read too, by the way. We do some of this every time I do a letter. I know it may sound a little redundant, but you got to do this work first. Letters generally, ancient letters generally had A to B, that is the author to the recipient, uh, a greeting of some kind, and Christian greetings were often like grace and peace to you. There is a thanksgiving or prayer wish, not always present, but usually present in Paul's letters. And then there's the body which is where, by the way, an important point, the point of the letter will not be in any place other than the body. So even though you get, might get excited about the Thanksgiving and prayer wish, that's not where Paul's going to be making his point. Now, he will be setting up his point in the Thanksgiving and prayer wish, but he won't be making his point there. And then final, there's final greetings and farewell. By the way, if you, if you go back and look at 1 Corinthians, sometimes the end of it, it looks like Paul stopped and started his conclusion three times. The reason for that is that because you were waiting for a carrier to carry your letter, if something new happened, you continued your letter. You didn't close your letter out until you actually had somebody to send it with. And so go back and look, if you have a chance, look at the end of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, it looks like it starts and stops several times, and that may be an indication that it took Paul a bit of time to get the right letter carrier. So, If you've never had a chance to see some samples of ancient letters that are not biblical letters, here's, a, here's an interesting example. They own to the most honored Tyrannus. Very many greetings. Heraclides, the bearer of this letter, is my brother. Wherefore, I entreat you with all my power to take him under your protection. I have also asked your brother Hermias by letter to inform you about him. You will do me the greatest favor if you let him win your approval. Before all else, I pray that you may have health and the best success unharmed by the evil eye. Farewell. And then the outside of the letter uh, was addressed to Tyrannus, and he had a function we don't we don't even know what a D.I. Sadie says, but he had some kind of a title. This is a letter. This is a letter to, in the first century. And notice we have A to B, a greeting, not a prayer wish here, but we do have a very short body. By the way, one of the things that distinguish Paul's letter from uh, other ancient letters is they're long. Paul's letter, unusually long letters. That's not the norm. The norm are these little short letters that go back and forth. Let me share with you just one more ancient letter. 
Irenaeus to Apollinarius, his, his dearest brother, many greetings. I pray continually for your health, and I myself am well. I wish you to know that I reached the land on the sixth month of, of um, Epipheth, and we unloaded our cargo on the 18th of the same month. I went up to Rome on the 25th of the same month, and the place welcomed us as the God willed, and we are daily uh, expecting our discharge. It so being that up until today, nobody in the corn fleet had been released. Many salutations to your wife and to Serenus and to all who love you, each by name, goodbye, and then the date, Masori 9. And then on the outside of the, of the roll of the letter is to Apollinarius from his brother Irenaeus. All I want you to see here is that when you look at a New Testament letter, it is the theological content that makes it different, not the form. Paul's writing letters like anybody else would in the ancient world. So let's take a look at Philippians as a letter. And if you use the, the, the basic form, you've got author to recipient in verse one, greeting in verse two. You've got a nice extended thanksgiving or prayer wish. Actually, it's a prayer wish in uh, chapter one, three through 11. The body then would go from chapter one, 12 to 420. And then you've got final greetings at the end, beginning in 421 to 23. One of the reasons I like to do this is because it reminds us that uh, what we're looking at is really a real letter that was delivered in the ancient world. All right, these are some interesting things to mark down just because it'll help you read the letter. There is uh, what we call disclosure statements. One of the things you want to start looking for as you're reading these letters carefully is when the author says, I want you to know. And Paul does that all the time. Or he does the re reverse. I don't want you to be ignorant, which is basically another way of saying, I want you to know. And so these disclosure statements often reveal uh, where Paul's trying to drive the letter. Here's the thing that I think is really helpful about reading letters. Um, letters were designed usually to get one and maybe two, but usually one job done. Okay, do you get the impact of that? A letter is designed to get something done. And so asking the question, what is Paul trying to help his readers do will help you get to the heart of any, any of the New Testament letters. What is the, when, when this letter was read before the various peoples, people that uh, heard it, what did the writer actually want them to do? There is an embedded hymn, which you can almost feel by its poetic structure. Uh, in Latin, it's called the Carmen Christi, the Song of Christ. It's certainly some of the thickest, best theological stuff in the letter. Uh, although I'm not sure it's the heart of the letter, it is certainly important. That Paul is thinking of this as an oral document comes out in that he says finally twice, just like a preacher, right? You guys have all heard sermons when the finally came up and it wasn't the finally. So Paul's got a couple of those. And particularly important in New Testament letters is that Paul has a petition. This is, this is uh, introduced by, I urge you, I encourage you, I want you to. Your translators can go in various different ways, but to basically have that import. And when you hit these statements, you're a little closer to the heart of what Paul's trying to get his readers to do. Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul will tell them, I want you to not be divided. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10, and it basically controls the rest of the letter. Because the rest of the letter is about things that cause division in the Corinthian church. The I urge you statement in Romans doesn't show up until chapter 12. So this doesn't always show up at the front side of the letter. One of my favorite uh, petitions is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12. Chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12, if you read those two verses, you actually get a summary of what's in the entire letter. And so it's a really great clue for what's up. 
we have a doxology at the end and then a final benediction. And so those are some pieces that help you kind of mark out what we're looking at. Again, let me remind you that what I'm hoping for you is I'm, I'm hoping to make you a better practitioner of your own reading of, of scripture, that you become better at this. Um, so that, and by the way, you may notice we don't start with the commentaries. We start with the letter. And if you're willing to do your homework on the letter, the commentaries, again, as I said last week, can become dialogue partners with you. And you're also in a pos position to disagree with what you're reading as opposed to just accepting it. I'm going to save this little piece for next week because um, uh, Paul, one of the questions in, in scholarship is how much rhetoric did Paul have? By the way, in the ancient world, uh, having the skills of speaking, rhetoric, was quite important. One did not become a leader without rhetoric. And the question comes, does Paul actually have any training in rhetoric? Because he seems to show evidence of such. Or is he simply, this is how we do things in the ancient world, and so that's the way he did it. So let me return to this next week, but I want to show you that we can actually outline Philippians as if it was an ancient speech. But I don't think that gets us down the road where we want to be today. So we'll come back to that later. Okay, some things you need to know as you're reading Philippians. There are words that show up over and over again, so those are obviously helpful key words. And so rejoice and joy are related words you find, and I've given you the references where you can find those words. Folks have often presented Philippians as the most joyous letter in the New Testament. I'd like to challenge that. You don't tell people over and over again to rejoice unless they're not rejoicing. So it is, it might be the, the most joyous letter in the sense that Paul keeps telling his readers to rejoice, but they're not yet. So one of the things I think Paul wants his readers to do is to be able to rejoice. The other theme that I wish our English translations would be very consistent in their translation of is that the word that there's a couple of words of thinking that show up thinking correctly, thinking rightly, thinking like Jesus. And so I've given you all the references where you'll find some word related to thinking. And there's two words that Paul uses. We won't get into, uh, you don't need to pronounce the Greek word. I'm just setting it off so you can see there's two different words that, but they're basically thinking words. And so Philippians would say, how you think is very important. Getting your thought processes together is important. And so two key words or sets of words are rejoice and joy, and then thinking correctly. So if you're, if you're wanting to underline certain things, themes, I go through the text and kind of mark these out so that you could actually, so you can actually see them as you're reading the text. Uh, quick history lesson. Uh, Philippi is a Roman city with a Greek Macedonian population. It was renamed by, uh, it was re renamed uh, Philippi. Notice I've got a P there. You know what? The, it's cool when you can correct things on the fly, isn't it? It's renamed Philippi by Philip II of Macedon. The former names is Crenides. After Anthony and Octavian, Romans, defeated Brutus and Cassius, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, made it a Roman colony. The reason you need to know that Philippi is a Roman colony is that Paul's going to use the word twice for citizenship. And I think it's intentional. He's kind of poking at who they're actually loyal to. So one thing to know about Philippi is that it's a Roman colony. And so the culture there, while it is basically Greek Macedonian background, it's also a Roman colony. So it considers itself a rather important city. The church in Philippi is the first European church established by Paul, and you'll find a little bit of the story there in Acts 16, 9 through 40. Members included a businesswoman named Lydia and an unnamed jailer. We get that from, of course, the stories in Acts. And because of the women that are mentioned later in chapter 4, 
women had a prominent role in this church. It's not spelled out, but you can tell that women, um, women have uh, at least important influence in this particular congregation. And as we find out at the end of, of, uh, of Philippians, this church supported Paul's ministry and was concerned to take care of him in his imprisonment. Well, let's take a breather here. Any questions come up, Les? Not, not yet. But oh. I, have, I have a question for you. When you talked about joy and rejoicing and not being the happiest letter, I, 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 not just about the audience, but I was wondering about the writer in his current context as he's sitting in prison. And when you're talking about rejoicing when you're in a suffering situation, yeah. it's so much a statement, isn't it, of, of, it is. of, of calling it forward in faith that you're trying to bring to others. And then they hear it in that context as well, which adds power to it. Very good. Well, let me shift chair, sharing this, sharing my screen for an outline. What I want to do uh, next is to, is to give us a kind of an overview of what's actually in, um, in uh, Philippians. And I've basically done two things on this particular outline. One is I've kind of followed the model of the letter, you know, that you've got the greetings, the thanksgiving and the prayer wish and, and the body. But I've also done in kind of large blocks, what I've tried to do is um, give you the important stuff from the illustrative or the illustrations and so I may have to go through this a few times to get it, but everything that's in red is an example of someone giving themselves away. Okay, everybody, you get that? And so all of these are not points, they're, they're supporting the point that's being made. And so let me kind of in large expanse, in a large expansive way, give you a chance to kind of step back and see this. So after Paul's prayer wish, the first thing he does, he begins to talk about himself in prison. And he's actually excited that his imprisonment is actually causing the advancement of the gospel. And Paul has op opposition he's dealing with there. And his opposition are preaching Christ, but he says, I'm just happy Christ is being preached. And so what we have in this first little um, biographical illustration is Paul giving an example of how he's handling life, as Les was saying, in prison, and how he was rejoicing that the gospel was advancing. And then it closes out with a comment for the um, Philippians to live a life worthy of the gospel. And then Paul mentions several times probably because of his close personal relationship to this church with him or without him. Because Paul has established earlier that he thinks he could, he could die this time. He doesn't know that it's going to happen, but it could. So, and then in chapter two, he gives us a kind of a moralistic statement about rejecting selfish ambition, considering others better than herself. And then he gives us the example of Jesus. And Jesus is the supreme example of someone who gave himself away for the sake of others. Next, Paul follows that with telling them to work out their salvation. By the way, the your here in uh, Greek is plural. And so this is not individual navel gazing, trying to make sure you're saved by yourself. This is work out your salvation among yourselves. We'll get to that and we'll, talk, we'll begin to tie it together. And after he says that, then he gives a string of examples. I have nobody like Timothy who cares about you the way he does. Epaphroditus, in fact, was willing to die for you. And then there's this strange little warning that seems out of place, at least scholars have thought about it, where he says, watch out for the dogs. But I think that little strange section is actually a counter example of what he's, what he's been doing already. These are examples of people getting, not giving. 
Okay, so every one of these examples here are examples of someone giving instead of getting. Someone giving instead of hoarding, if you want to make this appropriate to our times. And then so he's got his example, the example of Jesus, the example of Timothy, the example of Epaphroditus, the warning against those who are bad examples, getting, not giving. Then he returns to his own example of giving. This is where Paul goes into the part where he says, you know, if anybody had a pedigree, I had a pedigree, but I count it all but lost. Okay. And then he says, he kind of tells them, uh, join those who follow my example. As of course he follows Jesus. And then here is the main petition in the letter. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. The petition is often the thing the writer's trying to get done. I'm going to show you next week a couple of ways to read this, but this particular outline is reading this as if this is the problem in the letter. The problem is, is that Euodia and Syntyche, good people, by the way, notice Paul, Paul recognizes them both as good people. They are not working together. They are not agreeing with each other. And I've been in church life enough to know that when you have two people who are not on the same page, it can create a lot of disturbance through the community. And so Paul is telling them, he, after the petition, he says, be gentle, non-anxious, accentuate the positive. And then Paul comes back at the end and gives a, more of his example. And now he flips it on its head and said, oh, by the way, you guys have taken great care of me. And so it's almost as if Paul is saying, you guys know how to do this. And then there's final greetings. So here's what I'd like to propose, at least as at least one reading strategy, is that if this is in fact the problem that this church is facing, and it's had so much impact on the life of the church so as to rob them of their joy, then everything in the letter is designed to help these two women get their thing together. And if you notice, by the way, notice Paul doesn't get lost in content. We don't know what they disagreed about. We don't know why they were having a hard time. We don't even know who this extra person who's been called in to serve, apparently one of the leaders in the church. By the way, the letter is written to the church with the elders and deacons, but he doesn't ask the elders and deacons to actually do anything other than what the whole congregation is doing. Uh, some commentators will tell you this possibly is Luke. I don't know. Could be. But what this, what this loyal yoke fellow, by the way, um, it's an interesting Greek word that people have tried to turn into a name as if it's the name of the individual. But we don't know that name in the ancient world, so it's better to translate it out. Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement. We don't know who Clement is. It might actually be the church leader later that writes us First Clement, which is after the New Testament, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And so in some sense, this is the, the possibility here is that this is an incredibly practical letter built around the need to resolve this conflict in the church in Philippi. Stan? Yep. So so Bill asked the question, um, and, and it was about a different section, but it kind of layers in with this. So I want to bring yep. it. Paul was glad that the gospel was being presented even by those who were self-serving. Uh, yep. and, and in a similar way, I think there's some of the stuff here. But uh, so, And he says, so should we be glad of Kenneth Copeland's blowing away of the coronavirus uh, session? Wow. <laughs> well, if it works, I think we should celebrate it. <laughs> Hmm. 
I actually had to look up what that was, but I saw a video of it just now while I was trying to figure it out. But it, yeah. it, um, it is an interesting thing, isn't it? Uh, very different yeah. flavors um, and, and uh, different things. Yeah, I do think that Paul's oppositions were actually Jewish Christians who just wanted everybody to be circumcised. And so I think Paul was less concerned about their content than their demands for uh, ritual purity from a Jewish point of view. But I think it does give us some insights because uh, many of us have probably been raised in places where we want to shut down anybody who doesn't agree with us 100%. And I've discovered in life that's just a futile amount of work and it doesn't get you anywhere. And in fact, I think Paul, Paul is right as you, you, um, you celebrate the good that you see. In fact, all the way through this letter, Paul is reminding them to celebrate the good, particularly there at the end where he talks about extenuate the positive, you know, whatever is uh, beautiful, whatever is pure, think on those things. Yeah. And uh, somebody also asked, uh, what is First Clement? Ah, very good. First Clement is a document we have that was written about the year 97. It is, uh, Clement's name does not occur in it, but everything in church history would tell us that Clement wrote it for the church in Rome to the church in Corinth. And it was a letter that was designed to tell the young leaders in Corinth who had gotten rid of the old leaders that they needed to repent and uh, be submissive to the old leaders. I hope that helps. Yeah. I know a lot of these extra documents that outside of the New Testament, we may not always know. So feel free, always, always feel free to ask those kind of questions for clarity. But again, the letter dates to the year 97 and it's been preserved. In fact, it was so important to the early church that some of the early manuscripts of the New Testament contained it. And you can find it online if you want to read it. Here's what I'm hoping that will happen for you is that instead of seeing um, a letter like Philippians as, you know, kind of a string of little uh, sound bites or nuggets, you actually see that the letter functions as a whole and that once you see what the whole letter is doing, it begins to make more sense of the pieces. So let's say taking this as the model that Paul is trying to resolve this early conflict how does he begin to do it? He begins to do it by giving examples along the way of what it means to give, not get. He also, I think, offers a model of conflict management that uh, works upstream against current models that we use for conflict management. You see, in this letter, the point that each of the women are trying to make is immaterial to Paul. We've been called to live like Jesus. What does that look like? And so that's kind of the interesting thing that's going on here. And that, so you begin to see all of these examples as stacking up as a way of encouraging the Philippians to do what they need to do in reference to this particular conflict. And by the way, uh, for those of us who've lived through congregational church conflict, it can become very painful. And it's really hard to be joyous when folks aren't getting along. And so I think Philippians have got a, has got a couple of words for us. One is that uh, it's not about us. It's about what Jesus is up to. And I think the other thing is that maybe, maybe the things we take stands on are not as important as we think they are. I think the other message here is that those who follow the example of Jesus are willing to be exhausted as opposed to hoarding. And that we are in a time of having our characters tested right now. What kind of people are we? By the way, I'm very grateful that so many of you are here and present uh, in this class because um, it shows me that uh, there are people that are interested in and drilling a little deeper in the way of Jesus. And I find even though I've been a believer for a good number of years, that when I hear what Jesus is asking me to, to do, it's usually to go deeper. And so I'm hoping that with this outline that what I've been able to do is to give you a sense of, of 
the whole letter in kind of one view. So if you had to summarize what this is about, I would say it's about giving, not getting. Now, what does that look like in your world? Let me go back to the PowerPoint. In this particular PowerPoint, I've actually just put the outline here. I just wanted to spend a little time around what I consider some of the, the deepest theology, but I also want you to notice that um, uh, that this, this block here about Christ is actually one of a number of examples of what it means to be uh, the kind of people that give instead of get. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I'm this is, this is my least favorite translation for this phrase. It's, it's one of our thinking words. And I think it just makes a lot more sense to say, in your relationships with one another, think like Jesus. I like it that way. It's short and sweet, but the mindset, the mindset's right. I mean, it's a thinking concept, but think like Jesus. And then you begin to get the Christ hymn, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The Greek is, did not consider equality with God as a thing, as an opportunity for grasping or for taking or to grasp. Rather, he made himself nothing. We'll talk about it when we get a chance to look at this text a little more closely uh, next week. By taking the very nature of a servant, and then as if you didn't get the point, being made in human likeness, and as if you didn't get the point, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by coming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Hang on, my cursor has run away from me. There it is. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I'm quite surprised that we've not made this into a song more often for our time, but this is kind of the central illustration that Paul uses for the very nature of God is about giving and not getting. And then the reminder here is that it is God who in due season will exalt Jesus to the highest place. That it is service first, exaltation later. But I'm also wondering if, um, if you're one of the two women, let's say that I've got this context right. If you're one of the two women, how are you hearing this? who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See how the application might be right there for the ladies to think, maybe I'm thinking a little too highly of my own position. And I think interesting in the next one is that while it talks about God's exaltation, it also says that everyone, that in time, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth, under the earth, and every tongue can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory um, of God the Father. That this too, actually, uh, if you think about, Sometimes when we find ourselves in a conflictual situation, we really do, even though we're unwilling to say it, we think that we know better than the other person. That's just kind of a subtle way of thinking. We think we're better. I've shared with uh, a number of you as we've talked about um, uh, conflict in various places. I've discovered in my own work that there's actually really just one argument. You don't look like me, and I'm going to push on you until you do. <laughs> 
When we insist that someone else looks just like us, we really do think we're better and more important than they are. And so this letter actually challenges us, challenges us not to be the kind of people who even though we may know better, but we're not going to treat them as if they're less. And so I think it gives us a different operating model with people. So Philippians, one of my favorite letters. So, okay, that's kind of the grand overview. And one of the angles that I'm gonna take is that it's designed, this letter is actually, as in all New Testament letters, they're occasional letters in that they're written to a very specific historic location. And while this letter may encourage us and may shape us later, it was actually written in its first context to do a job. And the job I'm saying that it's, it's trying to do is to help this church in the midst of conflict. By the way, this was one of Paul's favorite church, uh, churches, and you can tell by the way he talks uh, to them and about them. And uh, you can also pick up on that on the way that they care for Paul. They care for Paul deeply, more than, more than the other churches. His, his relationship with Philippi was much better than his relationship with Corinth. So Les, that's pretty much for today. Um, let's entertain some questions or? Okay, everybody, any questions? Uh, this is sort of a question and a statement. Um, am I right that First Clement is included in the Catholic Bible? No. No, this is a group of writings that in the ancient world uh, was never collected the way we collect them today, but we call them the Apostolic Fathers. And this would include writings of Clement and Ignatius and Polycarp and others. Okay. So there's, there's a collection of writings that, and these are the, these are the first um, earliest documents past the New Testament. All right. Anastasius asks, so the Carmen Christi talks about becoming obedient to death. How do we as Christians do that then? Well, I'm witnessing some of my Christian friends who have the medical skills give their lives now as they take care of COVID patients. I think that's a pretty good and they're doing it because they love Jesus. I think that's a pretty good example of how it might look. So in some ways, it is, it is the anticipation that we would uh, care for each other very much like we would for our children. And I know, I know very few parents who would not absolutely give their life if it meant their child lived. So I think there's a couple of illustrations to get on that, so. Um, from me, one of, the, one of the things about the Karma Christi that I've heard in the past in my studies was that um, it's, he's actually quoting what's probably a common hymn for them. And, and so it's, this, it's considered to be one of the earliest statements mm -hmm. that we can find anywhere uh, about the actual deity of Jesus and the beauty of that, of that, 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 that chiasmic structure, you know, the, the, uh, was God, let it all go. Um, the, you know, and then was, was man and was raised back up to this high stature, that, that posturing. And, and, and it, so it, it sets when people try to put in this mythological paradigm onto what we've put together about our belief in Jesus, that this one really blows it away because textually we can go back really early and say, this is probably one of the earliest things that we're saying together as a community. That's right. It does certainly look like a song. The, the challenge that we've had with it to, is that it's not completely rhythmic in the way that a song would be. So it may be that Paul took a familiar hymn and he actually uh, added a twist here and there. So, which is an interesting way to catch people's attention is that if you'll, if you'll quote a, a song uh, and then you misquote one word in it, everybody catches it. Yeah. So I don't know if that's, that's what, but there's several places in Paul's writings where he, in fact, picked up material that seems to be older than, um, older than his letters. That is, he's picking up songs and hymns. Yeah. Can I suggest too, that I think um, those of us who have the spirit of God living in, a, in us knows uh, what areas God is calling us to die in. If, 
if the um, the path that you've suggested, Stan, about conflict resolution and management, uh, particularly uh, between the two women um, in in this letter, um, I think it it calls us not only to humility but also to uh, self reflect on our own areas of weakness and needing to be right and needing um, to be better than. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I I would suggest that. We, we all have an innate understanding of our areas where we could be um, acting more like Jesus. I think it's true. Mm -hmm. Murray, you put a good comment in your chat. Do you want to speak that out or would you have me read it? All right, I think I'm going to read it to you guys. I think it's great. So I find it interesting that when we think someone is wrong, we attack viciously, especially with social media. We go on the attack and try to destroy them for daring to do things we don't agree with. Yet Paul is actually very gentle and global in nature. We don't even know what these ladies are disagreeing on. Yet Paul finds good in each and actually builds them up. There is no judging even though this obviously is disrupting the congregation, we can learn from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I would also add that I'm, I'm quite amazed that as Paul talks about them, he sees them both as noble people. He may actually have an opinion on which one's more right or less, but he never states it. So great observation. I have a question. Yes, um, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, I talk on the phone. I feel that she has the spirit of fear. Uh, what should I do? Well, if Paul's giving us some good example, be gentle. Right? Mm -hmm. Be gentle and humble. Mm -hmm. Philippians actually invites us to consider others better than ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Thank I you. Need, I think I need more practice in that area myself. Me too. <laughs> Thanks. It's interesting. I think in many, most, almost always in, in division, there is fear as the author. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, someone's afraid of something causing something drastic that's going to change everything. And so they, 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 in that fear, end up coming against and it tears apart. So that is often the, off, the, the, the main root of, of what happens in division. Yeah. Let me tell one more story before uh, we hit the 11 o'clock mark. Um, when I uh, was an undergraduate student, I was finishing up some of my earliest Greek studies. I had uh, Dr. Raymond Kelsey, who uh, was my professor, and he knew that his time to leave was short. And so he began to reduce his load, but he wanted to teach. He wanted to teach, this was a summer class, if I remember correctly. He wanted to teach Philippians, Greek re, the Greek reading of Philippians and so on. I got to participate with one of the most humble and gentle people I've ever known in learning how to read this letter. And it's been my favorite ever since. For example, next week, as we begin to look a little closer at the content of chapter one, Paul is actually going to, uh, to pray for the Philippians that they might have the ability to discern that the Christian life is not a matter of just um, doing all the right things and missing the wrong things, or even a checklist that there is um, kind of a level, a level of nuance to the Christian life that's deeper than just, just a checklist. And so, um, so I, I share this with you to let you know that this letter is quite important to my own spiritual development. And so I'm glad that we're able to share this together.
sake. There's two more questions here, Stan. Yep. Why don't Christians do this? And I think we're talking about the divisive <laughs> stuff. Thing. Why don't more Christians uh, do this if they read the Bible? I had a friend many years ago, as he talked about the text, that says, be filled with the Spirit. Why does the Bible tell Christians who should have the Spirit why they need to be filled with the Spirit? And his answer was always, it's because we leak. <laughs> I found that to be as good of an answer on why we don't do what we should do all the time. We leak. In fact, one of the reasons I think we've got repetitious patterns like uh, attending worship together, sharing communion together, those kind of things is precisely because the Lord knows we leak. And so we spend our, in fact, most of what we do in, uh, in our uh, churches as we hear sermons and we go to church Bible studies, most of what we do there is remembering what we already know. Is that helpful, Anastasia? And David's question. So is there any information on the location of the church in Philippi following when Paul met them originally on the side of the river? I've read it was in a home. Is there any proof of this? Uh, I've looked at the evidence there and, and I would say, I don't know, you know, that little gathering uh, in Acts by the river is actually um, um, looks like it's an early synagogue forming. We, we know that the practice of the ancient synagogue was when you had 10 male leaders, you could actually form a synagogue. And I think that what Lydia is participating in is a pre-synagogue in, in Philippi. So, but outside of that, I know. And, and Danica has a question uh, about, she likes the way we're zooming out to look at and explain things of the whole letter. I, I've often heard people commenting that others frequently pick and choose verses out of their original context, out of their original context. How does this perspective on the whole letter affect how we can or should use smaller portions of it? Well, I think, uh, Danica, the, the one thing it does is it gives you a context in which to use the text. I think we can use text in extended fashions. I'm just usually uh, a little bit frustrated that Christians don't seem to understand the original text, which as Christians, they really ought to, right? So uh, it's real easy to take, um, um, see, if you take one text, just one of the texts about rejoice, and again, I say rejoice, if you don't know the context of the letter, you don't know that what Paul's trying to do is he's trying to help this church get unstuck. And so it's not, Again, I think anytime we take scripture and we turn it into a bumper sticker or a soundbite, we run the risk of not hearing it. If, in fact, the letter was intended to do a certain job, once you get that, the pieces begin to make sense. So I would encourage us to um, be the kind of people that, that when we use the text, we know that we're using it in an extended fashion. I think there's a lot that in, in, for example, Philippians that we can bring over and say, this is the way we should live. But you know, the one thing I, I think with Philippians is you've got these multiple examples. And so, so Paul says, live this way, but he also gives you an example of what it looks like. I can often run with that example and say, okay, how would that look in my, in my context? So. And so today, Stan, we're, we're taking this high-level view of the whole thing. That's Next right. Week, then I'm assuming we'll kind of dive into the first chapters. Yeah, let's do let's do one and two together, and see if we can't lay that for us. And then in the next uh, week, um, we'll do three and four. So, okay, Loretta, right. that it. Yeah. Well, then there was one more question from Loretta. I saw that. What exactly is of the same mind? Of the same mind is to thinking in partnership with one another. It certainly uh, doesn't uh, suggest that people have to think exactly the same thoughts because obviously that's impossible. But the same mind here is the mind of Jesus that's interested in giving oneself for the sake of another. And so I think that I find that to be a really good way to say it is that Again, all the way through the letter, uh, we've got these places, think like Jesus, think this way, think, uh, uh, in fact, uh, think on these things. And so um, I think sometimes we read it in kind of a Western contractual where it says uh, that the New Testament is a bit of a contract in which we, kind of, we have to read it exactly the same way. This is a much larger picture, which is um, what does it mean to be like Jesus? Jesus. 
And then the letter, I think, explores some of those avenues. In fact, I would argue that all of the New Testament letters are basically, what does it mean to be like Jesus? And it explores that in a very particular context, whether it's uh, Corinth or Rome or other places. So, Wonderful. Oh, let, let me give Loretta one other point. I think go through the letter and look how many times the word think is used and kind of highlight those places. And I think you'll get a larger sense of where Paul's going with it in Philippians. So. Great. Okay. I want to just, as we're wrapping up, maybe we didn't pray at the beginning. So Stan, maybe you can pray after I just give a quick, quick, uh, Update. So I, I, once the video is done compiling, I will send that out again this afternoon. And Stan, can I send out a copy of the PowerPoint as well? Is that fine? Yeah, no, it's in good shape. Yeah, let's send it. Okay. And, uh, and so you'll get those later this afternoon. Why don't you close us off with prayer? Father, we thank you today for letting us see Jesus again. Father, we deeply desire to be part of a community in which people consider others better than themselves. Father, if we're in the midst of conflict, please show us the way of Jesus as an answer to that. Father, if we're having difficulty rejoicing, allow this letter to communicate to us that we have much to rejoice in and much to have joy about, even in the midst of some pain and suffering. Father, we love you and we seek more of you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.